Hi everyone and welcome back to The Shack for part 3 of our Amstrad CPC 464 series. And if you remember the last episode, we ended on a bit of a low point. We'd given the machine a good scrub up and fitted new belts to the cassette deck and whilst all was good up to that point, things soon took a downward course. We'd installed our external cassette port so we could use these 6128 cassette leads and an external cassette deck or digital cassette solution such as this SVI CAS. But when powering up the Amstrad afterwards, we got nothing but a grey screen with a black border. Oh dear. And reviewing the connections I could see that I'd wired up one of the wires to the wrong pin. Let's hope there's not too much damage. Here at The Shack, we'd like to give a huge thank you to the sponsor for this video, PCBWay. They help us out with all of our PCB fabrication needs and make fantastic boards at amazingly competitive prices. And it's not only PCBs that are on the menu. Apart from other fabrication services like CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection moulding, PCBWay also have a great projects library of cool stuff to build from people all around the world. Oh, and if you don't like waving a soldering iron about, they can even assemble your PCBs for you. That's the PCB way. Right, on with the show. Well, let's start with looking at the schematics. And although I did connect the wire to the wrong pin, this pin isn't actually connected to anything anyway. So nothing untoward should have happened. But of course it has. Wiring up the correct pin doesn't correct the situation. So whatever's happened, it looks like a permanent break. Now, looking in various forums, it appears that a grey screen such as this is normally a RAM issue. Fitted in here are MT4264 64K by 1 bit chips, and many people seem to think that these Micron chips are quite fragile, so I thought the best thing to do would be to simply replace them. I didn't have any in my spares drawer, so a quick shopping spree and. Several days later. These Mitsubishi replacements turned up. Whilst I was waiting, I pulled all of the old chips and fitted these lovely new sockets. Popping in the new chips, let's cross our fingers and... Voila, a working CPC. I'm really pleased with this as I was fearing the worst and that we might have been on a hunt for a new gate array, but it appears if I did offend the Amsoft gods by saying how terrible Harrier Attack is, they've gone easy on me at least. So with all the wiring double checked and definitely in the right place, let's see if the external cassette port now works. Let's plug in the 6128 cassette leads to our lovely new port and then plug in the SVI CAS. We'll attempt to load the Specky Classic Manic Miner as I've never seen that running on a CPC. Control and enter, press play on the SVI CAS and then any key on the CPC and wait. Well, that works a treat. At this point, I'm entirely convinced that it was an amazing coincidence that the RAM chip blew at the same time as the first power on of the machine after fitting the DIN socket. Either that, or there were some static or micro charges that somehow made it to one of the RAM chips and caused it to fizzle. So with the external cassette solution sorted, the other thing I wanted to look at was this nondescript looking cartridge which has some pretty nice features. 
Based as it is on the ZX Dandinator project for the ZX Spectrum, this CPC version doesn't have quite the same feature set as the Spectrum version, but nevertheless does allow for instant loading of games, is totally jumperless and configuration free, and most of the heavy lifting is done by your home PC. So let's take a little look inside and then see it in action. Well, there's not a lot in here really. There's our 512K of memory used for storing the ROM images. Here's a Xilinx XC9572XL CPLD, which handles all of the logic. An AMS1117 3.3 volt voltage regulator and a CH340G serial to USB chip, which handles the connection to the PC. After plugging in the cartridge and connecting it to our PC with a good quality USB cable, we'll first need to install the drivers for the USB to serial chip. Click, 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 etc. And then we can run the Dandinator software, which is a Java program, so you will need Java 8 installed to run this. And powering on the machine, it can sometimes result in a misread of the serial connection and you get this unknown device pop up in Device Manager. However, powering the CPC off and on again will usually resolve the issue. Here we can see that our PC has recognised the CH430 in the Dandinator as being on COM7. Let's jump into the Dandinator software preferences and change the COM port from the default COM1 to COM7 as reported in Device Manager. You may need to refresh the COM ports if you've loaded up the software first and it didn't recognise the serial port on the first boot. With the correct serial port set, we can grab a handful of Amstrad CDT cassette tape images and drop them into the Dandinator window. The software will then spawn up several virtual CPC machines and load the cassettes into memory before converting them to ROM images. This can take a few minutes, but the resulting ROMs are compressed, so you should be able to store a good number of games on here. There's a little progress bar that shows you how full the 512K memory is getting, so you know when to stop adding titles. And you can add SNA, CDT and DSK images in this way. Once all of the games are loaded and converted, we hit the L key on the CPC itself and then switch to the programmer screen in the Dandinator software. What happens then is that the PC and the CPC will connect. The PC will send the files through to the Amstrad and the Amstrad will program the Dandinator memory. Once this is done, the Dandinator will reset the CPC and you can then load any of those titles by simply pressing the relevant key on the CPC keyboard. Nice! Now, not all games will work, especially multi-load games, but the majority of ones I tried did, and you'll manage to get a fair few games on here, of course depending on the size of the individual titles. There's also a nifty diagnostics program by Noel from Noel's Retro Lab, one of my favourite channels, I suggest you check it out if you don't already, and that's stored in a default slot which you can invoke by holding down the leftmost of the two buttons and hitting the reset button on the far right. And finally, you can leave the cartridge plugged in but bypass it by holding in the rightmost of the two left buttons and push the reset button at the same time. So there we have it, Alan Sugar's lovely CPC464 all fully working again and looking lovely and we have alternatives to those old tapes, but also a working tape drive if we really want the old school feels. I hope you agree that the addition of this external cassette port is a sympathetic addition to the machine and doesn't take anything away from the overall look. I think it looks really great. And this Dandinator is a cool gadget that lets you keep your favourite software to hand and instantly available for when you fancy a quick fix, albeit with a slightly long-winded process up front, but you get used to it and I guess that the point is you put your favourites on here and your favourites don't change that often. Right, that's it for today and as always we hope you've enjoyed the episode. If you like the channel please subscribe and hit the bell for notifications of new content. 
please leave your comments below as we always love to read them, especially if you've got Amstrad related goodies to let me know about. If you've got anything that you'd like to donate and see featured on the channel, please drop us an email. If you'd like to support us, there are links for Patreon and our Buy Us A Coffee page in the banner on the main channel page. So until next time in the Retro Shack, I'm going to play some Rick Dangerous on this lovely CPC. Goodbye from me and see you next time in the Shack. <laughs>